Imagine a world of solid financial policy and just the right amount in right type of regulation for private banks. Imagine in this world, um, many countries with solid um, currencies and you'd have a choice as an investor or as an entrepreneur, where to go, where to invest. Now, this kind of multipolar uh, situation is not what the US elites had in mind. So every time there's a banking crisis and things look really, really unstable, and this is always the pretext for more centralization of that system. So this kind of volatility that you saw with the Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Credit Suisse and others you know, on a global scale, this volatility and instability is intentional. So without this instability, you couldn't have centralization. And you've seen that some of the business of uh, Silicon Valley Bank is, is now going to uh, Bank of America and these type of super banks. Credit Suisse uh, originally wanted to compete with the American banks, but now, of course, that's done. They can't really uh, become a player like that. And so you'd have to understand how the system was built. Now, um, it was the British colonial empire, which invented the fractional reserve banking system. Okay, and it wasn't driven by some tiny little supposed private banking families. No, it was the empire itself. It was this huge cluster of aristocratic dynasties. And uh, they had all the scientists um, through the Royal Society. And they developed this concept of a fractional reserve system. And so competing powers in Europe thought this was a horrendous idea. This couldn't work. It would be unstable because then the central bank would have you know, other intentions than this private bank and the other private bank would try something else. And uh, the politicians would move into a different direction. And at some point, you'd have a bank run because people would fear uh, to lose their investments, their deposits. And in a fractional reserve system, of course, uh, these uh, deposits cannot be taken out all, all at once or even just 10 or 20% at once because that would crash the bank. Yet still, this fractional reserve system became the most successful system on the planet. And it enabled the British colonial empire to have even regular and smaller investors um, buy these government bonds and war bonds so that the empire could finance its wars and its, um, its uh, work in the colonies to dominate the colonies. And so the only way the system was ever going to work was through intelligence control. So if you control the central bank, of course, if you control the relevant politicians, if you control the relevant so-called private merchant banks, then you can actually control that system and make it work. And so this is pretty much what happened. And it's it's very, very different from the regular view on history. And it's very different from the classic, you know, uh, conspiracy view, right? Because the conspiracy buffs, they think that small, very, very tiny banking families came out of nowhere and took over the British Empire, which is, of course, ridiculous. Now, that myth was also intentionally spread by British intelligence to obfuscate what truly happened. And so um, you had uh, private merchant banks, so called private merchant banks, such as Barings or Rothschild. Now the Baring family, they go back all the way back to Hannover in Germany. And um, Hannover was kind of the origin of many British kings from uh, 1714 onwards. And so uh, the the aristocratic dynasties were very, very experienced in intelligence matters. So they had enough people and expertise to have their own family based intelligence agencies. And so um, they tended to recruit also among the uh, regular citizenship, citizenry. And um, they recruited people who seemed trustworthy, and then they tested them and retested them. And um, over two, three generations, the aristocracy could be relatively sure that this uh, that, that this newly recruited family was trustworthy. And that's what happens with the Barings family. And then they were sent to Britain and they created this uh, supposed private merchant bank, Barings. 
And then, of course, you have the uh, Rothschild family. This was a very, very uh, small family. And uh, they were recruited by the Landgrave of Hessen Kassel, also very closely related to the British throne in the British Empire. And so the intention was <clears throat> to create this seemingly new system and uh, to pretend there was a, a vast amount of change. This was a new world where people could come out of nowhere and have these uh, large banks. But uh, the Rothschilds were run by Hessen Kassel, aristocratic family, and then by the British throne and its uh, agencies. And so the United States adopted this system, this fractional uh, reserve system. And now you have all these um, systemic private banks, hedge funds. And uh, so there's always the possibility to come up with some, you know, some fresh billions and save a bank or save the system. Uh, there's a possibility of the central bank just creating new money. And of course, you can always, always um, harass the taxpayer and take money from the taxpayers to stabilize the system. So it's a very, very strong system, even though it's supposed to appear somewhat fragile, because only if you have that volatility and the occasional big scare, only then can you have this centralized system. It becomes even more centralized. So even more banks than Silicon Valley have problems and they are in trouble but um the system itself is really 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 strong so don't buy all this st stuff on the web when people say well the united states is in decline and you have to look at china and russia you know to, because they are successful no they're not successful it's um it's an intentional volatility that we're seeing here and uh, same thing in the european union the banking crisis of 2008 led to a massive, massive centralization of power. So the European Central Bank was never supposed to finance states, finance governments um, by printing new money or by creating new money. And of course, now they do just about that. The European Union was not supposed to buy um, bad debt and uh, bad obligations and to keep zombie corporations alive, but that's now what, what's been happening over here. And uh, national debt was supposed to remain national debt. There was no, um, there was a promise of uh, not generalizing debt among all of Europe. But of course, that's what's been happening more and more. And there are many mechanisms you can actually do that. It's not a full banking union yet, but this is probably going to happen. Same with the United States, where you won't be able to tell where government ends and private banks start and this was always 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 the intention of these this this fractional reserve system they do not want many countries that are stable have their own stable system and their own stable currency and 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 have uh, and and draw investors in right so this is classic imperialism and uh yeah so whenever a crash happens the u.s elites remain in control